Hey everybody, this is Russ from Game Core. I've got another mini PC to review today. This one's called the B-Link GTI 11. And if you've watched any of my other mini PC videos, you know that I really like to review these. And a lot of that has to do with putting as much power and potential as possible in a tiny little box like this. And this one has the potential to be the best yet. It has an 11th generation i5 CPU known as Tiger Lake, and it's the 1135G7. And it's probably the beefiest of the mini PCs that I've reviewed so far. And has some pretty neat features, such as a dual fan setup, as well as Wi-Fi 6, triple 4K monitor support, and apparently it's made out of high-end car paint. Here's a quick look at the specs. Like I mentioned before, it's running a Tiger Lake processor, and it comes in two different models, 8 gigs and 16 gigs of RAM. It also has an onboard Iris XE GPU and three different ways to store data. You have two M.2 slots as well as a one SATA port as well. Now in terms of price, the top of the line version is going for $700 on Amazon right now, but they're also featuring a $50 coupon as well. So at the end of the day, I'm considering this to be about a $650 computer altogether. So let's do all the things I love to do with these mini PC reviews. We'll unbox it, we'll compare it to some butter, and then we'll also play some PC games and emulators on it too. And of course, I'll also give some thoughts about whether or not I think it's worth it. So without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, inside we're going to get an instruction manual. It doesn't have a lot of information, just really the I.O. So let's see what else is inside. We have one power adapter. It's a little bit chunky. We also have a Visa mount if you want to hook it up to a monitor, as well as two HDMI cables. A short one if you're going to use a Visa mount, as well as a regular one. One handy feature is it has this little rubber tab at the bottom. It allows you to pull the bottom compartment off after you've unscrewed it. They also tell you which keys to push in order to get to the BIOS or the boot menu. So let's take a look at the other sides. We'll start with the top. Now this has a glossy finish to it, and it also has a fingerprint sensor on the bottom right, which I really like. But I do think that the top is a little bit too glossy. It's quite a fingerprint magnet. On the front, you have a power button, a clear CMOS button, two USB 3.0 ports, a headphone jack, and a USB-C port, which can also be used for a display. Let's take a look at the back. So on the top here, we have our exhaust vent, and then our power outlet. We have double 2.5 gigabit ethernet connections. HDMI and DisplayPort out, USB 3.0 ports, and also USB 2.0 ports as well. And then on each side of the device, we have our intake grates for the fan. And both sides are labeled with this GI5. I think that was a little bit unnecessary, but it is what it is. Now the AC adapter itself, it's a little bit chunky, but let's do a size comparison with some other things. And at first glance, this looks to be about two and two thirds sticks of Kerrygold butter. If I had to put a number to it, I would say it's about 20 ounces of butter altogether. But if you're looking for a more reasonable size comparison, it's about the size of an Xbox controller. So now let's take a look at the insides and see what we have to work with. This is held in by four Phillips head screws and all you have to do is pull that little rubber tab to kind of loosen things up and then pull it off from the left side. And here are the internals, they look nice and clean. Right up front you can see that it has an M.2 NVMe slot as well as a second one below it. And then it can also hold two sticks of RAM. Now one of the nice things that B-Link has been doing lately is been using name brand RAM as well as storage. And so this is 16 gigabytes of dual channel 3200 RAM. And on top of that, the NVMe storage looks to be made by Kingston. It's an A2000, whatever that means, but it is 500 gigs. And it looks like this board was made over the summer on July 23rd. So in addition to that second M.2 slot, you also have space for a two and a half inch hard drive, which you could just slot in right here. And the mini PC also includes screws if you wanted to screw this in, but I found that when you slide the hard drive in, it stays in pretty securely without the screws. Okay, let's put this thing back together and actually hook it up. So this is what it looks like here on my desk. It's pretty dang small. I would say this is quite a bit smaller than a Mac Mini. It has lights at the top and the front, and this is what it looks like in the dark. Now let me show off that fingerprint sensor because I thought this thing was pretty neat. I've never used a computer that had it before. Basically all you have to do is just hold your finger down and it'll log you into Windows. You have to set this up much like you would with a phone, but after that it's really easy. So moving on to the desktop here, you can see that I've already installed a bunch of games, which we'll test out here in a minute. And I also added some of the high-end emulators and ROMs as well. Altogether, I ended up filling about half the hard drive up. So taking a look at the properties here, you can see that it is indeed running that i5 processor, which has a base clock of 2.4 gigahertz, also has 16 gigs of RAM, and it's running Windows 10 Pro. Now, if you run a PC health check, you can see here that it is eligible for Windows 11. And that's a good sign because I think this PC would last for several years to come. 
So I think in terms of everyday computing, this is going to have no problems at all, but let's check out video playback. So I've reset the resolution here to 4K unscaled, and then I started up a 4K video at 60 frames per second, and as you can see from the stats here at the top left, it's doing a really good job. It's dropping about 19, 20 frames out of thousands. So I think when it comes to everyday tasks like browsing and shopping and taxes and watching videos, this is going to perform really well. So when it comes to gaming, one of the biggest factors is TDP for mini PCs. So if you go into the BIOS section by pressing the delete button when the device boots up, you can go into the power and performance section and then CPU power management. And from here, we can go and configure the TDP, which will affect the overall power performance of the device itself. And by default, it's clocked at 28 watts. But as you can see here, I set the power limit to 35 watts instead. Now, according to the documentation, it can go up to 64 watts, but I think that's going to be a little bit too high. I think 35 is a happy medium. So we're going to do a quick stress test here first. And as you can see, it's defaulted to 28 watts, but as we turn on the torture test here, you'll see it'll bump up to 35 watts altogether. And so I let this run for a few minutes to see what kind of temperatures we would get. And after about three or four minutes, it got to a range of about mid to low 80s. So I think that's pretty good when it comes to temperature. So at the end of the day, I think 35 watts is appropriate for this device. It's not going to be too hot, and it's also going to give you a little bit of a boost in performance, which I'll show you here later in the video. And part of this is the fact that ETA Prime did a video on this device a couple days ago, and he also kept it at 35 watts, and that dude's way smarter than me. So let's just stick with 35 watts. All right, so I ended up using two different controllers. I used the Xbox Series controller here from Forza 5 for most of my first-person shooters and racing games. And then for retro emulation, as well as PS2 games, I ended up using the 8-bit dough Xbox controller, mostly because this control configuration is more appropriate for those style of games. So let's get started with PC games first. We're going to start with some of the lower end games and then work our way up. We'll start with Celeste. So just to establish a baseline here, I'm going to run everything at 1080p, and then my goal frame rate is going to be 60 frames per second. Now this device is more than capable of doing 4K, but I think when it comes to 4K gaming, it's not going to do so great, so I think 1080p is a good middle ground. And as expected, these lower end games run really well at 1080p, but many of these games can run on phones or handheld devices, which gives you an indication of how much performance they require. But all the same, when it comes to some of these lower end driving games, platformers, or beat em ups, you're going to have no problem. Moving over to 3D games, here's Minecraft Windows Edition, and it's running at a solid 60 frames per second as well. So if you're looking for a PC that can run, you know, kids style games like Roblox and Minecraft, this will be fine. Moving it up a bit, here's Halo Reach, and this one is also staying at a stable 60 frames per second. And this is running at performance settings, which is kind of the low end for the Master Chief Collection. But either way, it ran really well and looked pretty good too. Now I'm terrible at playing first person shooter games with a mouse and keyboard, but I decided to try Counter-Strike just because. And the frame rate on this is pretty fine, although the controls were a little bit jerky, but that might have been my mouse and keyboard, which are both Bluetooth. Either way, I can comfortably say that you probably are not going to want to do competitive shooting on this mini PC. But let's take a moment here and just acknowledge the fact that this is my very first kill in Counter-Strike ever. Now, I never really play this game, but all the same, it's pretty cool. Now, the last PC game I want to show off here is Street Fighter V. I was surprised at how beefy this game was altogether, but if you configure the settings to medium graphics settings, it actually runs at a stable 60 frames per second. On certain stages, I would get some slowdown down to maybe 55 frames per second, but overall, it was a relatively smooth experience. Now, of course, this PC is not going to be able to play every game under the sun. For example, I installed Halo Infinite, but when I actually tried to play it, it gave me a big no-no. It basically said that I have to have my own independent GPU, which this PC obviously doesn't have. So that's about it when it comes to PC gaming. So now let's move over to my bread and butter. Let's do some game emulation. We'll start with Nintendo GameCube. And across the board, I could play nearly every game at 1080p with no problems. Now, 18 Wheeler ran at a max frame rate of 30 frames per second, but all the others that I show here ran at 60 frames. And as you can see, they run really well. And given the fact that these games are running so smoothly at 1080p, you might be able to bump it up one more spec as well. Either way, for 1080p gameplay on the GameCube, this is going to run at no problem. Even some of the tougher games to emulate, like F-Zero GX, had no problems. The only one that required some downscaling was Star Wars Rogue Squadron. This one I had to bump down to 720p, but as you can see it still looks really good and plays really smoothly at 720p. So overall I would say GameCube's a big win. So now let's move over to PlayStation 2. First thing here is I assumed I was going to have to do 720p, but it turns out that 1080p runs really well too. 
So we'll start off with Simpsons Hit and Run, and the reason why I'm showing this one is because in my last video I showed off Simpsons Road Rage and said Hit and Run on accident. So I learned a little bit about Simpsons driving game lore, and this one is basically like Grand Theft Auto, whereas the other one kind of feels like Crazy Taxi. I didn't really know that before because this is the first time I played these games, but this one seems to be really fun. Moving on, the Grand Theft Auto games all played really well, here's Vice City. And I'd say in general, PlayStation 2 was perfectly playable for the most part. And I would say about 90% of them did 1080p, and a couple needed to do 720p, which I'll show off here in a second. But you know, as I was playing around with the PS2 emulator, I did figure out one thing that does improve the video performance. If you go into the plugin settings and then enable the hardware hacks, one of the options here is you can set a half pixel offset. And that's going to fix some of that fuzziness and double picture that you often see in PS2 games like God of War 2. As you can see here, it looks nice and clear. Now unfortunately both God of War games do not play at full speed at 1080p. As you can see here it runs at an average of about 45 frames per second. Now if we bump this down to 720p it runs at full speed no problem. So I also wanted to show off how emulation performance is going to look if you use that default setting of 28 watts TDP. So what I did is I reset the TDP to the defaults and as you can see here it runs pretty well but not quite as good at 28 watts. You're getting an average of about, say, 56 to 57 frames per second. It's still perfectly playable, but if you bump it up to 35 watts, it's going to be nice and smooth. Now, my PS3 games library is pretty slim, but I did want to show off a couple games just to give you an idea of how performance is going to look. So here's the Prince of Persia reboot on the PS3. I really loved this game back in the day. And it's obviously running into some graphics issues here. You know, the character is not supposed to look so fuzzy and bright like this. And also, when you get into combat, it does dip down to something like 23 frames per second. Now, this game's supposed to run at 30 frames per second, so obviously it's not playing at full speed. That being said, if you try to play some of the easier-to-emulate games, things like DuckTales Remastered, you'll get 60 frames, no problem. Overall, I would say that PS3 is going to be hit and miss on this mini PC. It's probably going to be your upper limit. Okay, moving on, let's go over to Nintendo Wii U. Now this is Wind Waker Remastered, it's running at a solid 30 frames per second at the native 720p resolution. One quick thing I want to show you here is if you install the graphics packs for Wind Waker, that's going to help with the performance as well. And I also recommend that you set these two workarounds here at the bottom, the FPS slowdown as well as the integrated GPU fixes. But the main thing I wanted to show off here is the contrasty setting under the enhancements. You can go through here and kind of pick the saturation point that you like the best. Personally, I like the GameCube style, so that's what I'm going to stick with. Either way, Wii U seems to run really well. There may be an option here to upscale some games to 1080p, but honestly, they look beautiful at native resolution anyway. And of course, because this is the Wii U, I did have to try out Breath of the Wild. Now, I didn't make any sort of graphics enhancements other than to change the shadows to a low resolution just to help with gameplay. But as you can see overall, we're getting an average of, say, 55 frames per second. Given the fact that this game runs natively at 30 frames per second, anything above 30 is going to look really nice. It's not going to give you a solid 60, but all the same, this is a really nice way to play Breath of the Wild if you haven't played it before. And the last high-end system I wanted to test out here is Nintendo Switch. Now, unfortunately, using the OpenGL backend will not show any picture at all, and so you're limited to just the Vulkan backend, and as you can see here, it creates a lot of graphical anomalies. But even the games that don't have any graphical issues, like Link's Awakening here, unfortunately do not play at full speed. I was getting an average of about 23 frames per second with this one. Now this mini PC is fully capable of running Linux, and so because of that I want to try out my little Botticera flash drive, which I've showed off in previous videos. I'll also leave a link to this video in my description if you haven't seen it already, but basically I put the entire Botticera operating system and the games on this little flash drive, which allows me to plug it into PCs and then boot it up from there. So let's do that real quick. We're going to turn on the device here. We're going to press F7 to bring up the boot menu. And then I'm going to set it to boot from the USB drive instead of the internal NVMe. And just like that, my Botticera image loads right up. And now I have a working emulation front end, which also includes all of the games and all the configurations that I've saved already. And so this is pretty neat. This means that you could plug in an external hard drive or even just an internal SATA drive or even an NVMe slot and then put Botticera on there and then boot from that anytime you want to have a dedicated retro gaming PC. And as you can see here, the emulation works really well too. This is Final Fantasy X running on the PS2 at a 1080p resolution running at full speed. Now across the board, I actually think that PS2 will run better on the Windows side because it's going to be able to take advantage of DirectX. So I would say that PS2 emulation is going to be better on the Windows side. But Everything else should play equally as well as it does on Windows. 
And so yeah, if you want to do retro gaming, things like Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, PSP, and even GameCube and Wii U, I think they're all going to work really well on Botticera. And so this opens up a world of possibilities. You could put this thing inside of an arcade cabinet and have some really high-end emulation performance. And thanks to its small form factor, it's not going to take up a lot of space inside your cabinet. Now one point I do want to make is that the fans on this can get pretty loud under a heavy load. And it'll be especially noticeable if you have this PC sitting on your desktop. Either way, I'm going to play this segment here and just allow it to run at full volume. So yeah, I'm really impressed with this mini PC from B-Link. It has nice I.O. and good solid components, and it's also easy to upgrade the storage and RAM. After several days of testing, the only two downsides I had from it is the glossy top is just a bit of a fingerprint magnet, and the fans do get pretty loud if you're working in a quiet environment. And sure, at $650, it's pretty expensive, and you can definitely build a PC that's more powerful for less, but I don't think you're going to be able to find anything this powerful in such a small and compact form factor. Either way, I think that if you're low on space and you wanted to use this as a retro gaming console, either hooked up to your TV or inside of an arcade cabinet, this is going to be a really great choice. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming! Thank you.